My name is Mitch Yell. I am a professor at the University of South Carolina. And as I've been telling folks, I don't have a southern accent because I'm actually from Minnesota. My background is I was a public school teacher for 12 years in uh, Noka Hennepin School District in Minnesota. Went to the University of Minnesota uh, for, got to get my doctorate and then took my wife and three-year-old boy and five-month-old boy, moved to South Carolina with the intention of remaining for two or three years, that was 28 years ago. So I've been there ever since. I'm a professor in special education. I'm an educator, I'm not an attorney. Um, I also serve as a, I used to, both David and I have been level one hearing, or hearing officers. Uh, in South Carolina, we have a little different system than virtually every other state does. We have what's called a two-tier system. And so I'm now a second tier officer. We both have a quite a back, long background in, uh, in special education legal issues. And um, what, I would what we're gonna be talking about today are research-based interventions. And so we're not just gonna be talking strictly about legal, legal uh, aspects of research-based interventions, but how you can find research-based interventions and a number of other things. So um, we, uh, we did a pre-conference workshop and one of the things we talked about that in that decision was the new, was the Supreme Court decision, or in that presentation was the Supreme Court decision, Andrew F. V. Douglas County School District and, and uh, how important that is to us as special ed teachers and administrators because it essentially uh, changes or uh, has changed the definition of educational benefit in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And so that's gonna kind of uh, influence us a little bit in our terms of our presentation because uh, the purpose of special education really now, according to the Andrew decision, is to provide individualized programming that enables students to make progress in light of their circumstances. In other words, the purposes of special ed program programming is to improve educational outcomes. Now, one of the ways that we can do that is through using procedures that we know from evidence, from evaluations, from research that are effective in increasing uh, student outcomes. So, and, and essentially there, there has, there's a lot of research. Special education is the most hip, one of the most heavily researched areas in, in education. And the purpose of this research is really to develop practices, interventions, and strategies that will improve student outcomes. Or as the Supreme Court said, enable a student to make progress in light of their circumstances. Now the interventions, of course we use many different types of interventions in special education. We have reading intervention, we intervene in math, we not only have special education interventions, there's related services interventions, we do accommodations, program modifications, <clears throat> and it's important to understand that all these different procedures are not created equal. That interventions that we know, we know that interventions that are research-based are much more likely to improve educational outcomes, uh, positive educational outcomes, as long as they're implemented with what we call fidelity. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today is finding the research, what is the research, how do we implement with fidelity? And um, just one of, the, one of the things I want to talk about is I want to go back in time a little bit to 2002, specifically the, uh, the introduction and passage of a little law you may have heard of called No Child Left Behind. Um, if you look in that law, if you did, and I, I did this once, did a search, a word search in No Child Left Behind and found about 120 amp, uh, times that the word, scientific, the word scientifically based instruction was used in No Child Left Behind. Now, uh, David will be talking about uh, that a little bit later, but one of the reasons 
Um, that is really important with respect to what we're talking about today is kind of the impetus in passing No Child Left Behind. Now, of course, that was a very controversial law and uh, there were parts that people liked, there's parts that people didn't like, uh, especially didn't like. But one of, the, one of the major reasons for passing the law was what uh, the then U.S. Secretary of, of Education, a fellow named Rod Page, uh, talked about in 2001. And that was, he said, we insist that states pay attention to research. We're looking at evidence from classroom methods that we're looking, we're insisting that schools and states use evidence-based me classroom methods that really work. No fads, no feeling good stuff, no fluff, good solid instruction based on science. And so No Child Left Behind, all the way through it, you hear, see references to scientifically based instruction. Now, another event that occurred uh, in 2004 was, of course, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, which was the last reauthorization and amending of the idea. Julie just talked about it a few minutes ago. Um, that was 15 years ago. But one of the things Congress really wanted to do is they wanted to uh, take that the, the No Child Left Behind and try and meld it with idea. And uh, one of the things that George W. Bush did in 2001 that turned out to be very important in the reauthorization is he appointed a commission. He, it was called the President's Commission on Special Education. Uh, it was a report. He, what what uh, President Bush did is he appointed the then governor of a state near to you, Iowa, um, Terry Branstead, to chair this commission. And the commission involved, there was parents, teachers, ad administrators, uh, students, college professors. This commission was very broad-based, a lot of superintendents of instruction. And what they did is they held hearings throughout the United States on what can we do to improve special education programming for youngsters with disabilities. And they wrote a book. And, uh, or they came out, and I think they did like seven, nine, or maybe 10 different uh, hearings all across the United States, took testimony again from parents, teachers, administrators, college professors, about what they could do to improve education. And they issued a booklet, which it's, it's a actually still available. You just Google it. It was President's Commission on Excellence in Special Education. The new booklet was called A New Era of Special Education for, Chil for Families and Their Children with Disabilities. Really interesting uh, work that they did. And um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, important things is that they listed a number of findings. And one of their major findings is here. The current system of special education does not always embrace or implement evidence-based practice. So based on their, I think it was 10, 12 findings, they issued a number of recommendations. One of the recommendations was this. We recommend that regulations be issued that are consistent with best scientific evidence to assist parents, educators, and administrators in serving students with disabilities. And one of the ways they suggested that it be done is to take and meld the scientifically based instructional requirements of No Child Left Behind and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That was, that was a recommended recommendation that was published in 2002 and uh, Congress took up the reauthorization and completed it in 2004, the name of the law was the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, uh, signed by President Bush, incorporated into the idea. And here's how they decided how Congress determined they would include this scientifically based notion of, uh, notion of scientifically based research into the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And they included a little section in 1414 of the law, 
that said IEPs must include a statement of special education services and supplementary aids and services based on peer-reviewed research to the extent practicable. Um, and that's the citation there. So in essence, what they did is they didn't really define what they meant by this, but they just said we have to use research-based strategies in our IEPs when we de develop the services section. And that is not just special education services. It refers to related services, supplementary services, accommodations, modifications, program modifications, any, any particular service that we put in the IEP to provide a FAPE for a child with a disability must be based on peer-reviewed research. Now, um, they said a couple of, of interesting things in it. One of the things they said is, to the extent practicable. Well, what exactly did that mean? What, that, what to the extent practical meant is, when it was used in this context, text, uh, the U.S. Department of Education essentially said it means service and support should be based on peer-reviewed research to the extent that is possible, given the availability of peer-reviewed research. Now, peer-reviewed research, like I said, and David will talk about, we're a, there is a lot of research constantly going on in special education. Um, in fact, a, a man named Joe Stewitz from uh, the University of Iowa, or excuse me, Washington, he's retired now, but one of the things he used to study is the turnover of research in special education. And he, he it was his assertion that about every five years, we virtually have a, a new, new, whole new catalog of research-based practices. The field is constantly churning out new research-based practices. So what Congress is saying, is we have to understand what those practices are and we have to apply them in our students' IEPs. Now, um, what exactly is peer-reviewed practices? Well, Congress chose not to define it. As, as Julie said, they're not the clearest folks in the world and they didn't really define what that meant. But um, No Child Left Behind did define scientifically-based research and they had six different characteristics that would lead us to understand what scientific, the term, terminology scientifically based research was. And um, the sixth characteristics, characteristic of scientifically based research, they called peer reviewed research, saying that, so it's one criteria for determining scientifically based research in No Child Left Behind. And the way they define it is research must be accepted by a peer reviewed journal or approved by a panel of independent experts through a comparatively rigorous, objective, and scientific review. So in essence, what they're saying is peer reviewed research, we will find that in peer reviewed journals like Exceptional Children, um, Journal of Special Education, uh, those are peer re behavioral disorders, uh, the Journal of Learning Disabilities, Learning Disabilities Research and Practice. Those are peer-reviewed journals. What that means is that if someone, someone does a research in special education and they write it up for publication, they submit it to one of these journals who will have like three Three folks, both David and I, serve as peer reviewers. So the editor of the journal will send out the article with no names attached to it to three people who independently assess the quality of that article and the research that's been done. And then they make, an, they make a recommendation to, to the editor, uh, should you publish this? Is it, it, should it be published, but should they make changes? Uh, major or minor changes, or is it not worthy of being published in the journal? And then the, the editor gets the three independent reviews and they make a decision. So that's what peer review journal means. Um, I currently edit a journal called the Journal of Disability Policy Studies, and we view that, that review process very seriously. And 
all our reviewers do a really good job. So we get, what I will do is send out the research and get these three independent uh, assessments of the research that's been done and make a, make a decision based on the reviewer's recommendation. Um, and then both David and I re do uh, these types of reviews. In fact, David has even won awards, I think, for, for his reviews. But um, so that's what a peer review journal is. I mean, it's the best we have of science and special education that goes in and experts in that, in that particular area make an independent assessment and then we publish it. If it's published, that meets, that would literally meet the definition in No Child Behind, Left Behind of what peer-reviewed research is. Now, um, one of the things I, I've talked about, and I think you've probably heard a lot today is, uh, or it, the last two days actually, or three days today, is the term OSEP, the Office of Special Ed Programs. OSEP is, a, uh, is an office within the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education contains, I think, 16 or so offices. One of them is the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, one of them is the Office of Special Education Rehabilitative Services, which Julie just mentioned a couple of things from them. And they have a sub-office called the Office of Special Ed Programs. One of the things they do is they're, they're of course, a member of the executive branch. They're, uh, the U.S. Department of Education is a cabinet-level uh, office within the federal government, and OSEP is an office within that office, and one of the things they do is they issue what's called policy guidance. Um, they, if they think there's an important issue they need to address, they may issue guidance in the terms of a frequently asked questions document, or if somebody has asked them a particular question, say if, if David was really con concerned about a certain issue of LRE or peer-reviewed research, he could send a letter to Dr. Lori Vanderflug, who is the director of OSEP, and she would probably hand this letter off to one of her uh, consultants, and they might answer, and it's very likely they'll answer it. And sometimes they'll even publish those letters. Those letters are really policy guidance. They're not like laws, but they're interpretations of laws. When we get, a, and some of these letters have names on them, like this was a called Letter to Cain. It was a, a gentleman, and I don't know what his full name was, but his last name was Cain, and he asked him a question about what is this peer-reviewed research thing, and they answered him, uh, and they published it. You could find it on their website at one time. I'm not sure if it's no longer there, but it was in 2012. And what they did in this letter is and he asked again what peer-reviewed research is. And this is what OSEP said. OSEP said peer-reviewed research generally refers to research that is re reviewed by qualified and independent reviewers to ensure that the quality of information meets standards of the field before the research is published. Determining whether a particular service is based on peer-reviewed research, may require a review of literature or other information that reports on the use of evidence-based practices by peer providers. They went on, and then in another document, officials from the U.S. Department of Education went on to further state that states School districts and school personnel must therefore select and use methods that research has shown to be effective to the extent that methods based on peer-reviewed research are available. Again, that's that to extent, the to extent practical. Uh, this does not mean that the service with the the particular service with the greatest body of research is the service necessarily required. To, for a child to receive a FAPE. Although it does mean there needs, it needs to be based on peer-reviewed research. So that was OSEP's uh, attempt at really defining what, what this means. Now the other part that they didn't really address is what does it mean to be approved by an independent panel of experts using a, a rigorous analytic process? Well, uh, we're going to be talking about a number of websites where uh, 
such research-based practices can be found, but many of these websites are exactly that. They're comprised of groups of independent panels of experts uh, that will assess the research. And one of the, one of the clearest examples of that that you may be familiar with and we'll be showing you talking about a little later is the What Works Clearinghouse. Uh, in, the in, insta in the U.S. Department of Education sub-office or office called the uh, in Institute of Education Sciences. They, have, they bring together panels of experts every, you know, a number of times each year to study the research base in a particular area. So for example, they might, a couple years ago, uh, a, a colleague of mine, Mike Epstein from the University of was retired now, but was from the University of Nebraska, was appointed to an expert task to analyze all the research on classroom management. And so they spent the better part of a year just combing through all the research and uh, mel uh, kind of putting it all together in a really user-friendly manner that people could digest and understand. So that's what I mean by approved by an independent panel of experts. Now, another area that's really important that we, we really need to get a grip on this, if we're going to do, uh, if we're gonna base our programming on peer-reviewed research, as the law says, we have to make certain that that research is current and very importantly, that we apply it faithfully. That is, that we apply it with fidelity. Uh, and that's a very important part of research-based uh, research interventions too. Well, and what fidelity means, it means that we take the peer-reviewed research and we deliver it in the way that it was designed to be delivered. So if David has reviewed a particular reading strategy for the Journal of Learning Disabilities or something, and, and they get three uh, reviewers who say this is a really important piece of research, publish it, Journal of Learning Disabilities publishes it, gets out into practice. It's only as effective as in terms of how you implement it. If you don't implement it as it was intended, well then it, it, it may not work. And that's essentially uh, what a number of the um, people who actually were testified to the committee, uh, President's Committee Commission on Excellence in Special Education, like Dan Reschley uh, from Vanderbilt, he said, if teachers do not uh, implement instruction the way it was designed, then the most highly researched and effective curriculum may not be beneficial for students because you're not implementing in the way it's supposed to be implemented. So fidelity of implementation is very important. Another quote, if interventions are not implemented as intended, it's impossible to determine whether poor student outcomes result from an ineffective intervention or just an effective intervention that's implemented incorrectly. So it's implement, how we implement these research-based practices are, very, are extremely, extremely important. We have to implement as they were originally intended. Now, of course, the, the, the idea requires that peer-reviewed research be implemented in accordance, in, in our IEPs in, with respect to special education services, related services, accommodation, supplementary services. In other words, all special ed services have to be based on research. That's what the law says. Now, the law goes on to say that um, that is not the only place that we need to make certain that we base our IEPs on research. IFSPs, if you're in early childhood, they also, their interventions you use in IFSPs, which is in part C of the idea, also has to be, ba they have to be based on research. Um, now, uh, according to uh, a comments section written by, the OSEP, by OSEP and published in the Federal, Regula Federal Register, non-academic services that we use, like behavioral interventions. They have to be research-based. And then finally, professional development has to be, for teachers, that has to be based on research too. So you see, not only did we have scientifically-based research 
throughout the, the, uh, the No Child Left Behind, and even though that was reauthorized as, uh, as the Every Student Succeeds Act, as David will talk about later, that's all, all the way through that, too. And that's how research, the research became applied to idea. So it's, it's, it's uh, scattered throughout the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, too. Now, um, what I want to spend a little time talking about is there have been a few cases on peer-reviewed research. And as Jim Walsh was saying the other day, cases are interesting. I remember, he, I think he compared them to parables, parables uh, where they're, they're useful because they give us good information. They're useful in the terms that we can learn lessons from them, as he said. Now, um, I wanted to talk about a case that uh, was out of Pennsylvania. That's David's state. And I don't think David uh, was the due process hearing officer in this case. But it's a case called Ridley School District, VMR and JR, XREL, um, ER. Essentially what that means is ER was a student, second grade student. Uh, her parents were MR and, J, and JR, and they didn't have, they, just like Andrew F., they chose not to have their last name. Uh, in the case, so you just see the child referred to as ER through the case and her parents as MR and, and JR. But anyway, uh, ER was a second grade child with learning disabilities. She had allergies, she had health related problems. She was, um, let's see, let's see. Okay, what happened is, and I'm not gonna talk about the whole case because it involved another, a lot of issues, but one of the issues it involved was peer-reviewed research. And this was in 2012, so you know, it was a few years after IDEA had, had, had included that requirement that we base our IEP special ed programming on peer-reviewed research. So what happened in this case is that uh, the parents of ER were, didn't believe their school district, the Ridley School District, was providing her with a free appropriate public education under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Now this was, of course, 2012, quite, uh, quite a way before, um, or five years before the Andrew F. case, but so they were operating on, on what we called the Rowley case, Board of Education v. Rowley, which one of the tenants, or one of the, there's a two-part test, uh, one of the, the second part of the test is the services that we provide must confer educational benefit or must enable a child to receive educational benefit. Well, anyway, they didn't believe that their gr young girl was receiving educational benefit. Uh, in, a learning dis in, her school, in her classrooms or in her special ed program or her IEP, because they believed it did not, among other things, you rely on peer-reviewed research. It wasn't based on what the research said in reading. Um, and what the IEP team offered uh, ER, a reading program, which is a phonics-based reading program called Project Read. Now you may have heard of that. I was really excited when I read this case when, because when I was a teacher back in Minnesota, we used Project Read. Um, it was an Orton-Gillingham type program, very heavily phon phonetically based, and um, that's what the school offered to do. That's what the IEP team offered. The, parent, the teachers had been trained in Project Read, they were prepared. Well, um, ER's parents, requested that the school use the Wilson uh, Reading Program. Have you heard of that, the Wilson Reading Program? Well, um, the school said essentially, which they are right to do, is that we believe the Project Read Program, the pho heavily phonics-based program, will, is, is going to be a very good program for ER, and that's the program we choose to use. Well, the parents, took Project Read, they reviewed it, and they said, this is not appropriate. It's the research doesn't show it works. Therefore, they pulled their child from, 
the school from the Ridley School District and placed her in a private school called the Benchmark School, which was a school for youngsters with learning disabilities. Then um, they filed a due process hearing asking for tuition reimbursement. Uh, and it went to a hearing officer in Pennsylvania. David was a hearing officer, but it wasn't him. Um, but what happened is the hearing officer, and again, there were a number of issues in the case, but I'm only focusing on the, the actual reading program. The hearing officer f said that the school district, the Ridley School District, had failed to provide uh, ER with a free appropriate public education because the, pro the school used a reading program, Project Read, that was not based on peer-reviewed research as required by the law. Now, uh, so what the, the IHO, which is Independent Hearing Officer, did is he awarded parents reimbursement for the private school tuition and ordered compensatory education for ER. Well, the school wasn't particularly happy with that outcome, so they've filed a suit um, appealing the independent hearing officer's decision in a federal district court, and the district court um, overturned some of the hearing officer's decision, because I said there was a lot of issues involved, but with respect to the uh, hearing officer's decision regarding the reading, the district court judge uh, should have said, agreed with the hearing officer that Project Read was not research-based, nor was it peer-reviewed. Um, the parents then, because they didn't like the outcome, that they'd been denied tuition reimbursement, um, compensatory education, because of this Project Read being not research-based, um, the, excuse me, the, the parents decided to appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals because, that's right, the district overturned all those other decisions, but he also disagreed with the hearing officer. He found that Project Read was research-based and peer-reviewed, and then the parents appealed to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. That's a big deal. Uh, the U.S. United States Courts of Appeals are right under the Supreme Court in terms of importance. So here we have the first case testing uh, this, this notion of peer-reviewed research and asking if, a, if an IEP isn't based on it, does that necessarily mean it doesn't provide faith? So what happened is um, they filed an appeal of the, of the decision federal district court the circuit court um, ruled for the school district, concluding that there was a number of conclusions they, they made. Number one, they said the court didn't need to decide if lack of peer-reviewed research would be a denial of fate. Why? Because Project Read was research-based. There was research showing that Project Read was an innovative practice that met re the research-based criteria set forth by the Florida Center on Reading Research, which was a center at that time uh, was, chair was headed by a fellow named Joel Torgeson, who was a very influential researcher in reading. And his organization, which he founded, the Florida Center for Reading Research, one of the things they did was kind of like a consumer guide where they reviewed the research of all these different programs. Uh, by the way, they reviewed Wilson Reading, and they found that was research-based too. But when they review and they reviewed Project Read and said that's research-based. So essentially, he had both procedures having a base in research or being supported by the research. Well, what the what the court essentially said is, well, we don't have to make a decision uh, here about the lack of peer-reviewed research because Project Read is research-based. Additionally, they said, the IEP team retains the fl flexibility to devise an appropriate program in light of the, co compare of the available research, and there's nothing that makes them choose the method with the most research, 
if it's research-based, that meets the criteria of the law. And uh, they also said courts, as courts often say, must accord deference to the choices made by the school district. And of course, the school district in the IEP had decided that Project READ was perfectly appropriate because it was based on research. And this in an interesting, couple interesting things, court said the idea does not require the school district to choose the program supported by the optimal level of research as long as the program is supported by, some re by research and calculated to enable a child to receive meaningful and educational benefit. And that was the Rowley standard. So essentially they said there is research and it did meet the requirements of FAPE. They said, they went on to say a couple of other interesting things though. Um, a lot of people I remember were hoping that they would set a, kind of really give a distinct rule on when is something research based and when is it not. And they didn't do that. They said, the, the court wrote, we will not set forth any bright line rule as to what constitutes an adequately peer reviewed special education program. A bright line rule is a clear demarcation between this is okay, but you get in this side, it's not okay. That's a bright line rule. They did not do that. Um, the court went on to say hearing officers and reviewing courts must to continue to assess the pro appropriateness of an IEP on a case by case basis, taking into account the available research. We recognize this was an interesting thing. We recognize that there may be cases in which specially designed instruction proposed by a school district is so at odds with the current research that that may constitute a denial of fate. So what they were saying is that's an important thing. We have to, we have to strongly consider the research uh, and we have to apply it. And in fact, if, um, we do apply a special ed program or intervention that's at odds with research, that may in itself, according to the Third Circuit Court, could be a denial of fate. Um, now, uh, that, that's a pretty, that was a pretty big deal. And I think there's three really interesting points to note in this case. Number one is the Circuit Court, and again, this is right under the Supreme Court, considered the importance or the issue of peer-reviewed research. Now they could have said, oh, this is a methodology dispute. We have one methodology by the parents want, method, one methodology that the school wants, and when in methodology cases the school almost always wins, if it's just a methodology dispute. The court didn't, didn't go there. They looked at the research and they said, well, no, this both procedures are research-based, and just because the parents choose, or the school chose a research-based curriculum that was, had, they choose, chose a research-based curriculum, and the parents chose another research-based curriculum, well, you don't have to choose the one with the most research, you just have to make sure it is based or grounded in research. So that was really important. Then the court also went into a relatively detailed discussion citing the research from the Florida Center on Reading Research and how that supported Project READ. And that brings up the interesting question, what would happen if a school district had been unable to cite any research at all? What would have happened if you had no research, a, research, a non-research based strategy uh, suggested by the school district and a research-based strategy suggested by the parents. That's really not answered, of course, because they both had research behind them. But it'd be very interesting. Uh, what happened, uh, Barbara Bateman, who David and I are uh, very influenced by, she's kind of the grand dame of special ed law. She's uh, retired from the University of Oregon. She was an attorney and a special education professor cited reading research as one area that really could be a problem for school districts because there are so many reading curriculum out there, many of which have no basis in research at all. 
What if a school district is using a curriculum like that and parents wind up wanting a curriculum that does have research? What, will hap what would happen then? So if we look at, all, at the, what the laws have said uh, with respect to peer-reviewed research, both No Child Left Behind and the idea, and what these court cases, and there's like four or five court cases, but that's the most significant one because it's a circuit court case. And as Julie was just saying, Though also in special education, courts are very influenced by other courts, even if they're not in the same jurisdiction. This is a very important decision, a very important court. Okay, here we go. So what does this mean? What does this mean for us as teachers? Well, um, what it clearly means is that we need to be adopting and using research-based interventions in our special education services, in the, in the special ed services, in the related services, supplementary services, accommodations, program modifications. And we must be able to review, produce, and discuss research-based interventions at the IEP meeting, especially to, to support our chosen special education programs. And and actually, this cuts both ways, too. And I was at a, uh, an, I used to do IEP facilitation in South Carolina, and I was at a IEP meeting where the parents had found some autism research on the internet that really was kind of out of bounds. I mean, it didn't make a, a lot of sense, but they were desperate parents, and they kind of chose this as, this can fix our child. And they wanted that done. Now, it was it it wasn't it was it might have been chelation therapy, uh, but the school district was not going to do that, um, and they basically used the peer-reviewed research to say, well, you know, and this is a fact. There's no research behind that. We use research-based strategies, so they actually use that part of the idea to tell, essentially tell the parents, no, we that's our decision that we will. Rely on research-based strategies. We're not going to use chelation therapy with your child. That's our decision. By the way, here's your prior written notice because you uh, detailing our reasons for denying you, which, you, which you'd have to do. If, but the important thing is they did discuss it. And any time a parent brings up any uh, st strategies they found on the Internet that are research-based, discuss it. You don't have to accept it but you do have to discuss it. But be able to produce your own research and discuss your research-based strategies that we'll be using. And be able to support your decision. What if a parent, like in the Rid Ridley case, wants to, goes to due process here, files a state complaint. If you can't produce the research base, and they can, according to this, uh, the Ridley decision, that could potentially be a problem. So it's really important that we be able to support our decisions. And by the way, remember, the Third Circuit in the Ridley case re discussed the Florida Center on Reading Research. And the, and the school had cited that school, had cited that. The attorney, I believe, had an expert from the Florida Center come up and testify. So clearly, that was a very important part of this decision. So one of the myths, I remember hearing Jim Walsh, you heard him the other day, talking about peer-reviewed research right after the, no, he wrote a piece right after the Ridley decision. One of the things he said, schools, make certain your experts know that you're using research-based procedures. Call in experts that can, can testify that because if you're challenged in a due process hearing, that may be a very important part of FAPE. Now, um, the prob one of the problems in special ed, and certainly in our field, um, education's a really fad-driven profession. And David's going to talk about this too. But we kind of independently did uh, our own slides, and we virtually had one identical slide about education being a fad-driven profession. Um, that too often we don't distinguish between fact and opinion. And it's very important that we understand fact as, a, as opposed to opinion with respect to peer-reviewed research. That we understand the law is saying peer-reviewed research is a proved 
uh, by a peer-reviewed journal through a competitive, uh, comparatively rigorous process, or it's approved by an independent panel of experts. Also, articles, that, this is David's part, articles that appear in professional artic, uh, journals may be researched, but there's a lot of professional journals out there that are not research-based, are maybe opinion articles, and you have to distinguish that too. And there's a lot of journals out there that aren't peer-reviewed, which kind of essentially would not meet the requirement of, of the idea. And finally, we have so many fads in special education. We're not gonna talk about them much. Uh, David, might, you want, might wanna mention a few of them, but multiple intelligence, learning styles, facilitated communication, block scheduling, chelation therapy. These are all widely used interventions that don't have any objective research support. Let me give you the example of, well, we all know facilitated communication. Facilitated communication is the, the procedure whereby there's a youngster with autism and they have a facilitator and a, and a keyboard and supposedly the facilitator guy or holds the youngster's hand and the youngster types out whatever it is they want to say and you know I mean there's evidence in some of these so-called professional journals that say kids have written poetry and novels kids with autism through this method well virtually e every single study that has ever been done shows this is facilitator control it's the person guiding the child, it's not the child. And there's been some very nasty things. There have been children who have been guided to type out that they're being sexually abused by their parents and have been taken from their parents because, and it was essentially, we know, there's no basis in fact for facilitated communication, it doesn't work. Another one, chelation therapy. A number of years ago, I had a call, I was asked to be an expert witness for the Department of Defense for a, a case out of Belgium on an Air Force base in Belgium. And I thought, oh good, I'll maybe be able to go to Belgium, but I wasn't. I, what I did is I reviewed all the IEPs, went through it, and the parents wanted chelation therapy. I, I don't know if you know what chelation therapy is, but it's for youngsters with autism. It's a technique that was developed in the 50s to treat people who painted uh, seagoing sea vessels with a very heavy lead paint. And it turned out they, were, they got lead poisoning from it. And so there was this procedure developed where they would be given a shot of some, and I can't remember, it's one of those $20 words, uh, uh, some kind of uh, shot that would actually expel the lead from their blood. And it, it wound up being relatively effective in cases of things like lead poisoning and arsenic poisoning. Well, in the 19, I believe it was actually in the 19, late 1980s, an autism organization kind of glommed onto these, this chelation therapy, saying, well, you know, one of the real problems is that youngsters with autism, it has to do, they were vaccinated. That was the problem because there was an element in the vaccine, vaccines called thimerosal, which would introduce mercury into their bodies, and that's what called autism, caused autism. Well, in fact, there's no, never been any research and, that shows that is the fact. There's been a lot of research that shows vaccines didn't, don't do that. But nonetheless, what this one autism society said is, what you need to do with your child, and they publish on the internet, is take them to some, as some doctors, they listed a number of doctors, get this chelation therapy. So they would be given the shot, and the idea of this gets rid of the mercury in the child's blood, and they go back to normal. Well, desperate parents were thinking, oh my gosh, this is a cure. Um, not thinking about research, which there was none. There was no research that showed this was effective. In fact, the research shows this can be horribly dangerous. It can lead to cardiac incidences, liver poisoning, kidney failure, it's horrible. Uh, but people were wanting it, and that's what happened in this Defar Department of Defense case. They asked the Department of Defense to use chelation therapy with their youngsters, and I wrote a report on it, went through all the research, and found, you know, there's no research that shows this is 
works, but there's plenty of research shows, that shows it can be horribly uh, damaging to a youngster's system. And so I wrote my report, and it wound up not being able to go to Belgium because they, they settled somehow, or it was the end of the case. But that is just an example how we tend to be really a faddish profession. And parents, who are often very desperate, also sometimes glom onto fads. For example, now, so we wanna, we wanna be able to identify research-based interventions. Do we identify this by going on the internet, which a lot of parents do? No. Inter what we find on the internet is not based on research, unless it's a site, a legitimate site, and we'll be talking about those later. Just for curiosity's sakes, Google searches at four times in history, in, in four points in time have searched the term autism cures. 2005, on Google, you did this autism cure, you came out with 530,000 autism cures. February 2008, 4,400,000. November 2012, 7,660,000 autism cures. Last night I did a Google search, there were 29,500,000 autism cures on the internet. That is not a good way to be identifying research. Legitimate news organizations. Uh, I remember when this facilitated communication issue was, was a widespread and people were saying, my gosh, it doesn't work, uh, it's facilitated control, there's bad things happening, it seemed to die out. I was watching the NBC Evening News two years ago and they did a story on facilitated communication. They called it something else, but it was the same thing. So news organizations are, organizations are really attracted by sensational and sometimes bogus claims. So we have to be careful at publishing and commercial companies. David and I, year after year, go to the Council for Exceptional Children. I mean, they have a huge floor, a, a floor, a commercial floor where people are selling things. Back in 2004, when peer-reviewed research appeared in IDEA, everything. Peer-reviewed research this. Everything was peer-reviewed research. We have to remember, companies want to sell things. Uh, those are not good places. So what is good places? Just what IDEA says. The uh, peer-reviewed journals and um, panels of independent experts assessing the research, like the White, Her White House Clearinghouse. Or, excuse me, uh, the What Works Clearinghouse. Now, a fellow named David Berliner, who was the dean up until a couple years at Arizona University, once wrote an article where he said, education is not a hard science, but it is the hardest to do science. Um, and we have to understand how important it is that we, we be able to identify the real science when we're looking at interventions to put in our IEP. So, uh, David. Last week I did preparation for a due process hearing. And I, I'm a former hearing, hearing officer and what I do for districts now is I prep the witnesses for due process hearings. And we were sitting there and we're talking with the teachers. And the teachers, and we basically, how do we prep the, the teachers? We bring the teachers in and we ask them questions say, okay, so what did you do with this kid? Right? And then when things didn't work, how did you make decisions based on when things did not work? And it's interesting, and I've been prepping, I, I was involved in 85 due process hearings last year, about 60 the year before, um, 91 year, about three years ago. So it kind of waxes and wanes, but what's really interesting about this is teachers on the whole get their information from other teachers. They don't pay attention to research. They pay attention to the teacher who is down the hall. They pay attention to a, an article that they have or something that someone mentions. They're not analyzing research on this. So what it's interesting about this is I, I query the teacher. Uh, so it was, it was a teacher where the, the kid was being, um, uh, basically he was not learning, to, he, was, he was not reading. And some of you may have seen the presentation I did on dyslexia yesterday, and there are some methods out there that are clearly not as good as others. But what's interesting is the, the kid was not reading, so they had a reading method, it was a, and it was a, a very low, the kid was a very low reader. Uh, IQ of about uh, 38, so they were, they, she was using the Edmark reading series, 
And then she said, well, it, it wasn't working, so she just was making flashcards and that of, of words that she thought that might be good. And there, there are lists of words out there that can help kids to understand what's going on. We call them the danger words, and we have the things we want to, want to talk about. But she was just making up words and things like this. He was also not understanding these words and then making any progress whatsoever. So I said, we're, so you, you ditched a series that has some research validity on this and is known for being working with kids with low reading, do not doing something like this. Parents were suing for the time that she was, and they did not know what she was doing in the class. All she knew, all we knew is that she was not making progress. And they were suing basically that things weren't working. So we were, I said, I, I went to the attorney out in the hall later and I said, I, we can't put her on the stand. We can't, we can't do this. I said, this is, this is not something we can do. And so it's, it's interesting. So I'm, I'm going to that district uh, at the end of September to talk to them about how they make decisions about what they're supposed to be doing. And this is something that we need to talk to teachers about. I, I fell on my sword yesterday when I talked about dyslexia, when I said that we're not doing a good job in higher education training individuals to work and teach kids who have dyslexia. I'm well aware of this. I, I'm, I'm honest. I'm, I come from a, I'm a faculty member. I, 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 they, they come out of my class knowing, but others don't. So, okay. but it's interesting. But we also do not teach teachers to be critical of research. We do not teach teachers to be critical of when they hear something. They'll go to an in service, and, I, and some of you have gone to in services that are crap. Spelled, and there's an, it's an acronym, C-R-A-P. But it's, it's crap and things like this. But they, you go to this in-service and there's a problem. I remember going to an in-service, an all-day in-service, when I was my first year of special education teacher, on how to, take, how to teach kids on how to take notes in color. Right? I needed help on writing IEPs. I needed help on developing behavior plans. I didn't need to teach my kids on how to take notes in color. But that was my in-service, and I was expected to implement that with the instruction that I was doing as a part of that. And then at, shortly after, uh, right before that, the movie The Color Purple had come out. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. It's, it's, it's a wonderful movie. But they were teaching kids to read by hanging up words on various objects around the room. So my special ed director was mad at me because I, I, mean, I had a very, I, I basically had a large closet. Special ed was an afterthought in my, in my district. I had a large closet. And so she said, you need, to, you need to hang up signs on all these words so the kids learn what these things are. Is there, there's, is there research that works on this? Maybe, maybe not, but this is how we make decisions. And so we are not, teachers are not making decisions based on this. So I can guarantee if you put a teacher on a stand and they're asked how did they make the decision about the, the methods that they use to provide instruction and the methods that they use to take progress monitoring data on this and the methods they use to graph that progress monitoring data and if it's all teacher made materials, teacher made tests and there's no research validity on this, just don't put them on the stand. Just don't do it. Don't do it. All right. But we need to think about our teachers as a part of this and make sure that we train them to start asking these questions. So when I say, is this important? It really is. Because first, these kids, they're, they're first, these kids don't need to be guinea pigs any more than they, they are already. We need to use things that are already working and try to use those with these kids as opposed to constantly switching from thing to thing. And yes, I understand this. In, t in special education, we have the ability, okay? change. We have the ability to do things and pay attention to things and move, move the things, but use things that there's some research relating to it. Now, how do we do this? And just building on what was Mitch very nicely articulated, we need to talk about the different levels of research and the different levels that are associated with this so that we can build on this and actually teach the teachers this and implement the things relating to this, right? So the first, the three levels of research and what are the criteria, and use these. So what I'm talking about this is basically is the different levels. And yes, I, and if you want, I can talk faster, okay? Uh, those of you aware of this, and I, 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 I come from a family of, interp of, of uh, auctioneers, so uh, one thing that I want to let you know is if any time I'm talking too fast, you have two options. Either raise your hand, tell me to slow down, or make a bid. Whatever's necessary, um, I, I, I can do this. Yeah, I, I. Right. basic research, test of theory, level of research, two, things like this. So when we talk about this basic research and, there, and the problem, 
And this is one of the problems that we have in special education is that special ed, there is no such thing as an average kid with autism. There's no such thing as an average kid with learning disabilities. So it's hard to often get large scale samples of these things. It's much easier to get a larger scale sample of fifth grade, regular ed fifth graders than it is to get kids because of the individual needs of these kids. So one thing that we have is we sometimes are lacking this, but it's not without attempts. So when we talk about this, level one is just very basic research, okay? And this is things like the descriptive studies and qualitative studies. I'm, on, I'm, I'm leading several dissertations right now having a wonderful time on that, by the way, because it's someone else having to do all the work, and I just, just do this over is, is, my, is my common thing. But yeah, um, and if anybody's interested in books on how to write a dissertation, I have a really good one. Ask me later, and I'll give you two, and it really is helping, so things like this. I didn't write it, but, I, uh, but I'll tell you about it. Descriptive studies and qualitative studies, just basic, they're, they're basically kind of asking and kind of feeling your way around this by getting impressions of what's going on. I did a qualitative dissertation, which was a bad idea. But it's understanding this is it takes some time, but it gets, it's, you had some bi inherent bias on this, okay? Correlational data. And there is, there are core, there are things um, that we have where there's correlation to what's going on. Hey, for, in, for instance, in my town, um, there's, a, there's a very high correlation. I live in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. There's a very high correlation between the sales of um, ice cream cones and accidents on bicycles. Okay? And so we've noticed this, and I, I'm a cyclist, a very proud cyclist, not a tricyclist, you, um, as you call me, but a, a, a cyclist, and I did go biking yesterday in the Monon Trail. That's a, that, that, that's a fun place. But it's interesting is, uh, it really was, but I, I talk about this is, do, do ice cream cones cause bike accidents? I'm vegan, so I don't do ice cream, but yeah, but it's interesting, so it's, it's not, but, so I, that's, that's how I can bike safety. But it's interesting about this is, it's because the, as, as, as the, what, the temperature gets warmer, the sales of ice cream increases, as does the number of people out there biking. So we talk about these things, we see there's a lot of correlational things, but we have to talk about causation. And that's what we need to address as a part of this, and pay attention to more kinds of things like this, so pay attention, okay? Second level, classroom application. You need to be able to ask your teachers and be able to have them answer to you, how did they decide to use this method? Right? And there are, there are there, and I, I, I said this yesterday, but there are parents out there spending an enormous amount of time on the internet looking for answers to the problems for their child. I applaud the parents for doing this. I want the parents to be involved in what's going on. I want the parents to participate. I want the parents to understand what's going on. And I want the parents to pay attention to what we're doing here. But what's interesting about this is they're hearing things and they're bringing them to our meetings. And then we're having to figure out what's going on with these things. There are reading methods out there that are less than good. Okay? There are some reading methods where actually uh, there's been studies where the reading methods where the kid is actually doing worse at the end of the year than they started at the beginning of the year. And so, there, so we have to think about these kinds of things, but we have to talk about classroom application. Now, one thing, and I, I said this yesterday, I'm gonna say this again, never, ever, ever write a specific reading or math method in a child's IEP. Don't, a, a commercial method, things like this. Just don't do it. Just absolutely don't do it, okay? Because you're bound to that method, you're bound to that, the, the curriculum that's associated with this, and that, that causes significant problems if that doesn't work. So never, for, even though I, I'm a, I, I stand in front of you as a fan of SRA corrective reading or Wilson reading programs, things like that, do not write the child will receive instruction from the Wilson language program. Just don't do it. Okay? But also, whenever a parent asks you, doesn't matter what program they ask you, even if you think it might, even if you think what you're doing is good, when a parent asks you for a specific reading program, don't just automatically say no to it. Just don't automatically say no. What you need to do is you need as a team to fully consider is it necessary for the child to receive FAPE. So if the parent goes to a workshop 
or an, a virtual workshop or uh, some online flyer that they get and they found, I find, hear about some, some reading method and they think it's the amazing thing, they bring it to you and then they ask about this. Don't just automatically say, no, we're doing, we're doing what's good, all right? Make sure that you as a team consider this method, pay attention to this method and see it could actually meet these kids' needs and that is identified by the needs that, is, that we've identified prior as part of the present levels. And, and, and does it address those kinds of things? One flows directly to the other, okay? It would be wonderful it would be wonderful as a part of this if we have, we have teachers who are going to be able to implement these things. Some of these reading methods out there, um, I, and I'm blocking on which one it is, but it requires the, this teacher to do the language arts instruction for two hours of uninterrupted time every morning without a break. Okay? I don't know how many of you have two hours of uninterrupted time every morning that is consistent without kids, without breaks, or with the kid having to go to PE, kid having to go to speech, um, breaks for library, just other things. You, it's some of these things we have to do, think about fidelity, but actually also implementation. Okay? And some of these things are, are burdensome, and they're, 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 hard, they're actually hard to do, but you need to think about these kinds of things as a part of this. Okay? Next, level three is large-scale trials, okay? And we, again, as I said before, we don't do a lot of this in special education because we don't have large-scale school districts with kids, a whole bunch of kids with autism. So we don't often do a lot of things like this. But the hard part is we need to use these as talk about, about level three interventions because you're gonna be asked about this. So what is the question we ask at due process, what the, the parent's attorney is gonna ask at due process hearing? How did you choose this method? What is the research behind the method that you have? So these websites that you have, you can see as a part of this, this the, the handout here, is that there are things, great websites, but you need to think about how we use these, right? So here, here are some fads. We've already talked about some of these, okay? Some of these, things like this, um, and it's, it's hard. Because people, and I want, you to be kind of, I want you to be really cautious about how you describe these things to parents. Because parents, I mean, I have some parents who, I live in Pennsylvania, they took their kid up to Boston to attend some workshops relating to multiple intelligences. And they came back and they said, we need to make sure we have multiple intelligences written into the child's IEP. And how we're going to actually ab approach these kinds of things, all right? And I, I, and I happened to be leading the IEP meeting at the time, and I said, I, 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 this, this talk about the actual needs of the child and how we're going to address those as opposed to going there. I didn't want to say to the parents, you know, Howard Gardner's a smart man, but there's not a lot of really specific research that demonstrates this, and especially for kids with disabilities, so I'm not gonna do this, and I didn't want to say that you wasted your money, that you are a whack job, or anything. I didn't want to say that, but I was thinking that, so be really cautious how you say this, because parents, when they talk about this, they, they've, they, they've come to you with truly the best interest of their child, and Think about this. Some of you, I, I, know, I don't know how many of you have watched advertisements and you see these advertisements and it's amazing what these advertisements do and when you actually buy the product or see the product and you realize it's, not, it's, it's, it's crap and it doesn't work, okay? I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Um, I'm not going to tell you things that have happened in my house, but we, we, yeah, we, yeah. I don't watch TV so much anymore. But it's interesting, but pay, pay attention to these kinds of things. One thing also up here, is that, that you, it's, you may think is, is controversial is block scheduling, okay? Now block scheduling is for kids with disabilities often hard to implement, especially in the secondary program where you have block scheduling where you have only maybe four classes per day. How do you get in their special section that they need for intensive services? Or, and in many places that are doing block scheduling, they are doing it because of the lack of time so of, of transition so that the kids aren't in the halls enough and that's where the problems are. So it's more for behaviors and other things. But we're finding the teachers, I, we've, I, we, we've, I've looked at the studies at this last spring, is that the teachers are not doing anything different as a part of their block scheduling other than more worksheets. And so it is posing some problems, okay? 
And the last one, learning styles. If you want to watch a good video on why learning styles don't work, there is a wonderful one. It's only six minutes long. It's by the man who did it. It's by the name Dan Wallingham. And he talks about how learning styles don't work. He's a professor at the University of Virginia. Um, it's, his last name is Wallingham, just like it's spelled, W-A-L-L-I-N-G-H-A-M. He has a great like, six-minute video on the YouTube that you can access. Um, for those of you who, uh, I, I, am, I am like this with YouTube. So I have found my way. I understand where things are. I've been lately watching Russian dash cam videos. So they, you can kill a lot of time there. But he has a great video on why learning styles don't work. Share that with your team and talk about this, OK? Right. So what do we need to do? Criteria to judge whether practice is research-based. So this, this is actually what you need to think about as a part of this. Okay? Is it valid? Is someone else recommending this? And have there been reviews, as Mitch articulated on this? Have there been peer reviews that talk about this? And have, they, and have these reviews been replicated? There are studies out there, and this is the problem. I'm going to put this out here. This is the, one of the problems with academia, is that we only publish studies that show something that works. I, I'm really, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I actually talked about setting up a journal of studies of programs that don't work. I think that would be just as important uh, to find out which ones don't work or why, why there are issues. We only publish studies of programs that actually work. Often in very, very, in, um, very sterile conditions. Uh, give, you, give you an example. My, my, first, my, my second year of teaching, we did a, a big study in my classroom. My classroom was not much bigger than like, like three of these tables. And we brought in two observers to sit there and take uh, uh, on task behavior of two of the kids in my classroom. It was a classroom that was very small and you bring in two extra adults who are staring at the kids all, all the time. The level of attention went through the roof. And I was thinking we should just bring in extra adults just to sit there and stare at kids. That would actually solve a lot of the problems. Okay, so but we actually did this, this great study and uh, um, it, it actually got me into my PhD program because the study we did this and critiqued what's going on, but we actually monitored things, but just the, the change of this, but it was a very sterile environment, having these two extra adults sitting there staring at the kids the whole time. I'm really serious about this. Pay some age just to sit there and stare at the kids and take notes. You'd be surprised what the, how bad, much better the behavior of the kids would be, okay? Referee, that means, is it peer reviewed data on these things? Um, I review for eight or nine different journals, and I have no idea, on the whole, on the whole, I don't know who writes these things. There are some I know, actually, I, you, you, yeah, we, I, know who, who, I don't know who writes these things, and I truly am trying to improve the profession and improve what's going on. I don't know what's going on, and sometimes I never find out even who wrote these things, if it's a bad thing, okay? okay? So what do we need to do? have teachers who are part of textbook adoption committees, have teachers who are part of choosing curriculum make their decisions based on whether the material works as opposed to whether it has better reproducibles for the teachers. All of you who have been on textbook adoption committees know exactly what I mean by this. Okay? We, there, there are some method, there are some reading materials out there that have never been, that we school districts adopt, that have never been tried with kids. It may work. It very well may work. I'm not telling you it don't work, but it might, but we at least find something out there that does work. And there are methods out there that we do use, okay? okay? Discourage teachers from picking and choosing based on their personal preference, all right? I know that none of you who have been on, on textbook adoption or, or to committees or on choosing materials for your district or team, things like this, teachers become comfortable with what they've been using. They know the sequence and they don't want to switch because they've been comfortable with what they're doing. Okay? I'm in higher education. I've been using the same textbook for my intro to special ed course now for 20 years because I know what it says. I don't want to try a new one. I don't, I'm, I don't want to change. It's, it's, it's good, uh, Jim and Dan's. And so, yeah, but it's interesting about it. I don't want to change. I probably should, but things like this. Okay. And Bonnie Grossin of the University of Oregon talked about this. To be a profession, to have professional knowledge base comp com compromised, com uh, comprised of shared procedures that work. 
The medical profession balked at this back about 100 years ago because one of the standard ways, oh, 150 years ago, one of the standard ways of actually dealing with a lot of issues was through leeches and bloodletting. Okay? There are times where I know that many of you would like to use bleaches, uh, leeches and bloodletting within your school district, but we don't, we, we, um, I think you have to get more CEUs in order to do that. So, okay, but uh, that's a different matter for, for your conversations with Jolly. But interesting about this is they've standardized the procedures and there was balking because it said it would reduce the creativity of the profession. Isn't reducing the creativity of the profession one of the things we often hear from teachers about we are reducing my creativity within the classroom? Actually, I, so to be candid with you, I, my first year teaching, I luckily became heavily involved with using SRA's corrective reading. And I would use that, I had the kids for about 60 minutes, I would use that for about 50 minutes, and I knew that they had gotten a dose of something good. Okay? It really didn't matter what, it, that last 10 minutes, I became so creative because I could try things and I didn't have to worry about whether they got something good because they got something good. So it freed me up. I didn't have to worry about things. But I had standardized this and I, my, my kids' grade, my kids level of reading instruction went through the roof that year. My principal came down to me and thought I was falsifying the tests. So which, which I was pretty pleased that he said it that way, but he didn't, he didn't think it that way. Okay? Okay? So, um, I didn't like my principal. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, he's, he's still principal. Okay. Theoretical framework, okay. what is being considered? There are different theories about how to do this, research design about this, how you evaluate this, and, but it, it, it isn't, right? The research methodology, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna move past, and this is all there, implement, implementation and replication, but the evidence of results, evidence of results. Um, some of you may have read about this study. I mean, it's an oldie but a goodie. But there was a major study done in the United States in the 1970s. The study was called Project Follow Through. It was a reading study where they actually studied over uh, many, many thousands of kids across the United States in urban areas. And they, provide, they did eight different reading programs. If anybody wants information about or, uh, some summaries of that, don't uh, feel free. Shoot me an email. I'll send, I'll send you a summary of it. And so um, I, I make my students read it because we don't talk about this, things like this. But there are reading programs out there that are clearly better than others. And what are the end up results of these reading things? And how do these kids actually implement these? Not only can the teachers implement these things with fidelity, because that is the next question that I often ask as a part of prep for due process hearing. How did you choose this? And how much time did you actually spend implementing this program on a daily basis? With third question on this, so I, first, let me give you the, 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 my, my hearing prep questions for teachers. How did, you choose this, how did you choose this method that you're using? Second, how, 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 how long did you implement this program? What kind of schedule was it? Were you able to feel, did you feel like you're implementing this with fidelity? And third, what training did you get on this program? This is, these are the questions that you need to be able to defend your actions. If you can't defend your actions, I'm not going to put you on the stand. I'm not going to do this. I'm really, it's not, it's not worth my time, it's not worth the time, and you're going to settle anyway. I, I, I mean, I... I, I I, I, so it's, it's interesting about this is we, that you need to think about these things as a part of this, is making sure that you're using methods that work but are also defensible. The Supreme Court, very specifically in the, in the, in the Andrew F case, two, a little over two and a half, less than two and a half years ago, said the def, if the actions of the school district are defensible, you're fine. Those are not defensible if you can't act, articulate answers to those three questions. So if, without that, you really do have some problems there, okay? So what is quality evidence, okay? Here's some examples here. I got some, I'm going to skip down, okay? okay? Journal articles. There are some journal articles that are better than others. And I, there are some journals that are basically just summaries of other articles. And um, in, our, in our spare time, we, we, we write books. And we basically, let's... 
I know, I know some of you have spare time, but a lot of spare, that's what, that's what we do. But it's just, the way we do this is we're summarizing other things. It's not original research. So we go to journal articles to obtain the original research and figure out this. And there are some journals where it's like, like I, I, often, I often write for the journal uh, Ed Leadership, because I, I, I write for administrators and principals a lot. Spend a lot of time in it. I just, have a, just had a textbook come out for special ed directors. Uh, pretty excited by this. Just came out a few weeks ago. But we're summarizing things, but when, I, when you see articles in Ed Leadership or, um, uh, we, and others, like I'm, I'm writing something for National Association of Elementary School Principals right now, it's a summary of research, it's not original research kinds of things. But there are articles out there that you can talk about this and, and pay attention to this, okay? Uh, I'm gonna skip down a review. Be a smart consumer, okay? Many of you remember the advertisements for Hooked on Phonics? Okay. Saturday, I think Saturday Night Live even did a, a parody of the Hooked on Phonics advertisements, things like this. Uh, so it became part of the mainstream. There is no there there for Hooked on Phonics. But parents were asking for it in IEP meetings. Parents were demanding this in IEP meetings. So what we need to think about, okay? Make sure, that the, make sure when we talk about this, especially for special education, if you choose a program, make sure that that program is designed for the kids with whom you are implementing, okay? And this is something we often think, we often negate, is it's, it's research-based, it must be good. Think about the program and is it working for the kids with whom you're actually using, okay? Or are there some things like this? There are different programs, okay? Wait, and the, here, last thing here, if the program's not reviewed, it doesn't mean it's bad, it just was not reviewed. And why I talk about this is, Use programs that have been reviewed. Use programs where there's data out there. Use programs that have been tried. Use programs where there is something out there. And you're thinking, this is tying my hand. No, there's a lot of programs out there. There's a lot of programs out there that, are, that have worked. I, I, I gave that list yesterday in the, in the dyslexia presentation about programs for reading that, are, that we've shown to work in the past couple of years, and, there, and also the list of programs that don't work. There are programs out there that do work, and we need to pay attention and address these kinds of things. Okay? Okay, so look for research yourself. But, so t teach your teachers to be critical. Teach your teachers to be critical of what is being done in their classroom. Answer, have them be able to answer, is there a better way to do this? Is there a better way to monitor what's going on? Is there a better way to provide instruction? Is there a better way to take data? We need to learn from these questions because not only does it become defensible, but it's better for the kids. It's better for the kids. And the problem is, as I, as I alluded to when I first started, is that teachers get their information from other teachers, which is not inherently bad. That's not inherently bad. But most teachers are not critical of this. Okay? One of the classes that I teach, it's a fun-filled one, is I teach, I, I, it's, it's, it's fun for me, all right, okay? But I, t I teach a research course, but I teach people to be critical. I teach people to be critical of advertisements. I teach people to be critical of, of every single thing that's out there. So we, we start with basically just with, with um, advertise, uh, with, we start in our class with just basic polling data, of which you all are hearing polling data on the, on the uh, various presidential nominees, things like this, which is actually making decisions about who actually gets to participate in the debate that's coming up in two weeks. But we, I'm, I'm critical of monitoring polling data and things like this. There are some places they're taking poll, they, they present polling data from internet sites, where do you, if you like a candidate, or I'm, I'm my local Walmart, Hey, at my local Walmart, which I happen to have lately have been going to, but it was interesting. They have, they have a, um, a satisfaction button next to the cashier. Are you satisfied? And if you don't press it, the, 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 ca the cashier will press it for you. And so it's, it's being used to evaluate the kind of data, whether the cashier is effective and whether people really like what's going on. And some of these cashiers are getting like 110% effectiveness. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what this data really means, but they're doing good. They're doing good, all right? So I'm, I, I don't think it's increasing their pay, but you think about these things like this, but okay? But look at, uh, collect these data, but be very critical. Be critical. And that's what you need to teach your staff on this. You need to t talk about these kinds of things because 
we talk about correlation, we talk about information, but we need to talk about where we get information, okay? So I got one more, th um, okay? Got some websites that, I'm gonna that we have as a part of this. National Center on Intensive Interventions, okay? It's a great website put out by the American Institutes for Research in, in, down in Georgetown in DC, but the National in Intens Center on Intensive Interventions, okay? It's, uh, their website you can see up here is in intensiveintervention.org. They have lists of information that you can use to help you steer data, but also how to be critical of data and how on the decisions that you're making as a part of this. Finally, the last question, the, when I ask as a part of due process hearings is you have data, how are you analyzing the data? And, are you, and if you're not, then why the heck are we even taking the data? Okay? I've, I've seen many districts who do not take progress monitoring data. I, I've made fun of this. Some of you in my presentation on Tuesday about this. I'm seeing, I'm seeing districts not taking progress monitoring data, but use the data to make informed decisions. You have the leg up on this. You're the one actually providing the instruction for the kid. You're the one who's there with the kid. You're the one observing the kid. So you're the one can pay attention to what's going on with this kid. You need to monitor what's going on and make changes about this. Because the last thing, because this is, this is the case. This is why I settle so many cases. Of those 85 due process hearings I was involved in last, last year, okay? And I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've only been involved in six since July 1st, so it's, it's a slow start to the year, and I'm not involved in one till Tuesday, so I've got the weekend off. But it's interesting about this. Of those 85, we settled 79 of them because we did not have other data or we did not use the data for informed decisions. Okay? So there's one thing. If you learn, so be critical of what's going on. Take data. But if you find a child is not making progress, you, you knew I was going to get this, work this in-house somehow. If you find out a child is not making progress, change what you're doing. Don't just sit there and do the exact same thing over and over again while the kid continues to suffer and not make progress. Because too many of the cases that I was, I've been involved in just, just recently, the districts did nothing to change what was going on. They found out that the kid was not making progress at the end of the first marking period, did not make any changes. Second marking period, did not make any changes. Third marking period said it's too late to make changes in this year. We won't make changes until next year. We have kids who have suffered throughout a year, through a whole year, and not made progress. Do something, make changes, and you'll be a lot more effective. Okay? So, if you are interested, there's two things I want to share with you. Hey, Mitch and I are st uh, we, we're starting to share more information on special education legal matters. We're going to have a, a regular blog posts. I have a Twitter feed that if you would like to sign up for, I strongly encourage you free. We're not going to try to sell you anything. Uh, it's the, the Twitter feed. The Twitter handle is Sped Law Blog, all one word, S P E D L A W B L O G. Okay. Sped Law Blog, okay? And yeah, that's the Twitter feed. We also have a Facebook page, Sped Law Blog, and we're going to start doing some blogging things on this, okay? If you go to Sped Law Blog Twitter, you'll see that the, the Twitter feed we put up, to, I think, this morning is that the Irish Center, based out of Vanderbilt, which has great modules for training things, put out a new module just this, just this morning on training administrators on how to be part of IEP teams uh, and leading IEP teams. Um, so yes, I, I know the author of that really, really well. And that's why he's standing in front of you telling you about this, because he's really proud. Okay, it took a lot of time to put this together. But go to, go, so, so yeah, go, go, but go, sign up, sign, go, sign up for Twitter at Sped Law Blog. We will not overwhelm you, but we'll get information out to you. The final thing is that if you want more information about uh, uh, readings on how to be critical, email me. And uh, my email address is my name, David Bateman, at me.com. So I'll be happy to send you information that you can use that are easy reads, but to get your teachers to be critical. So it's my name, David Bateman, at me.com. I'll be happy to send things. I've already responded to anyone who sent me things from yesterday asking for comments of things about dyslexia and 504. So get that information. We're going to reround the rest of the day. Please ask questions about this, but I'm so glad you're here because please take this one seriously. Thank you very much. <laughs>